Welcome back to New World Next Week. I'm James Corbett of CorbettReport.com. And I'm James Umpilato for MediaMonarchy.com. How has serving impacted you? We've got that story. Plus, tenants win physical keys over smart locks. But first, announced at the very last minute, I had even found myself in the pre- recent weeks just like, when is that thing going to happen? Announced at the very last minute and pretty much already underway by the time folks are, are watching and hearing this. Confirmed secretive Bilderberg meeting to be held in Switzerland essentially this weekend, May 30th. The 2019 edition of the exclusive Bilderberg meeting will take place this weekend, Thursday to Sunday, at the Hotel Montreux Palace in the Swiss town of Montreux. Of course, hipsters will know that as the home of the famous Montreux Jazz Festival. According to the Swiss daily Tagus Anzeiger, U.S. Secretary of State Mike Pompeo, always making an appearance on your Neural Next Week episodes, will be among the attendees. He's not on the official guest list, though, of the Bilderberg website. They spell the thing wrong. The Swiss paper reports that Pompeo is set to sit down with Swiss Finance Minister Yuli Maurer to discuss the situation in Iran, where Switzerland represents U.S. interests. So that's kind of an interesting thing. Nowhere on the agenda, or at least the official agenda. So we wonder what are sort of red herrings put out there for folks. So we switch to a different source. We switch to global research and the true story of the Bilderberg Group and what they may be planning now. Bilderberg Group, meeting behind closed doors, of course, Hotel Montreux Palace, May 30th to June 2nd. They are at least publicly announcing Time Magazine, Man of the Year, Nobel Peace Prize winner, and architect of secret bombings of Southeast Asia, Heinz Kissinger, Swamp Thing's chief Zionist and son-in-law, Jared Kushner, NATO madman, Ian Stoltenberg, former Goldman Sachs bagman, and triple citizen, James. I was reading up on the governor of the Bank of England, Mark Carney. They, among many, many others, will be attending. CIA, Bear Santo, Secretary of State Pompeo, also present the list of guests and personalities consulted on the official Bilderberg website, which again, James, they did this really, really late at the, like just the last minute within probably just 48 hours of the event kicking off. So they have the topics list. And I know we've talked about these in years and years and years past here of Neural Next Week. The topics announced by the organizers for the 2019 Bilderberg meeting are a stable strategic order. So they start with, you know, that's just the simple, easy stuff they can <laughs> solve simply. What next for Europe? Climate change and sustainability. China at number four, or Russia at number five. The future of capitalism, Brexit, the ethics of artificial intelligence, the weaponization of social media, the importance of space, and finally, potent potables. Oh, wait, that's a Jeopardy category. Cyber threats, James. Any of those lists? I mean, again, they kind of put this out, and it's a big kind of show, and there'll be those corporate news outlets that either won't cover it or they'll cover it and say it's good. It's just, again, you know. I've got, you know, longtime friends who, you conspiracy guys, you all love this Bilderberg thing, right, James? Yeah, love. I don't know if that's quite the right word. Wait, wait what was agenda that, item? We get into that. We get all excited about yeah. it, I think. It's yeah, joke. I understand. Uh, what was agenda item number nine again? That would be the weaponization of social media. Where have I heard that before? Yeah, what was the title of episode 332 of the Corbett Report again? The weaponization of social media. Uh, well, I, I guess they're listening to the Corbett Report, as as we uh, as we uh, could have concluded. Yeah, interesting, interesting stuff. And of course, as I've mentioned before on in our conversations in the past, and as I was recently talking to Luke uh, about this, yes, I think these are the cookie crumbs that they're leaving on the table for the interested people to follow. And there are some interesting cookie crumbs out there, like the weaponization of social media, which I think we're intended to take as they're going to be talking about those evil dastardly Russians messing with Facebook elections and what have you, but could very much be the episode 332 type of weaponization of social media. How can we weaponize this and use it against the population, which I imagine is more to the point. Um, And there are some interesting people on the participant list, of course, Jared Kushner, uh, make America great again, guys. He's fighting the deep state by going to Bilderberg and getting marching orders you know, from Kissinger. I mean, <laughs> uh, too bad for all those people who got lost in Q-Land somewhere along the way. It was nice knowing you. Um, uh, the, uh, one that I found particularly interesting on that list, actually, is Nick Bostrom, who I believe is a first-time attendee. Of course, the co-founder of the World Transhumanist Association. What does that portend for the direction of the talks of these uh, these meetings. But again, as we say, 
this is the agenda list they give to the public. Who knows even the, what these broad categories of conversation, what they're specifically talking about and what's being talked about in between and around the conference is probably even more important. And then there's always the question of who's being teleconferenced in or who's who's attending that isn't on the list, like Pompeo. And, and Pompeo is one of those ones they throw out there. There always seems to be this, like they'll, they'll in the even in the mainstream media they'll admit, oh, this person is there, but he's not on the list. So there's always even those that are thrown out there. There's just a lot of a lot of confusion. Hopefully, we will get some real details about what might be going on inside. I'm not holding my breath for that, as I say. And since uh, Jim Tucker passed away, there hasn't been a lot of real inside reporting from any sort of inside sources. So I'm not holding my breath, but we'll see what comes out of this year's meeting. We've got, I'll include those links right there to you and Lou talking about Bilderberg 2019. And he actually just published something a couple hours ago as, as we're taping this. Bilderberg 2019, big surprises, Stacey Abrams and also Space Force. Just some of the other sort of, again, sort of powers that shouldn't be, you know, it's sort of names and faces that kind of get thrown into the mix. And again, we sort of cheer and jeer about them. I've been saying on the show for a long time, it's sort of, you know, they give us our heroes, they give us our villains, and we're supposed to two-minute hate on them, or, of course, you know, buy a bumper sticker and say we love them. Speaking of buying bumper stickers that say you love stuff, James, our second story this week on New World Next Week, episode 374, U.S. Army pones themselves for Memorial Day on Twitter. Last Friday, May 24th, heading into what was our big American holiday weekend of Memorial Day, not to be confused, of course, with Veterans Day or Armed Forces Day. But hey, when you're or as much as America is, you know, you need at least three holidays to kind of cover it all. So heading into that big weekend, the United States Army on their official Twitter account at U.S. Army asked Twitter users how the service has impacted their lives as part of some feel good Memorial Day campaign. The really sad and poignant responses, timely reminder of the toll of war. Appropriate for the holiday, probably not what Army PR team intended. Here's just three that I I, I picked out of before. And again, everything we say and play, always included in your show notes. When I was 18 in 1970, I tried to join the Air Force because both my uncles were USAF. I took some tests and they wanted me. But on the way home, I got stopped and busted for two joints. While in jail, an Army vet just back from Vietnam came in and hung himself in the bunk just below me. Or this one. My mother was a lieutenant and triage nurse in Vietnam. She's been a broken person for the last 50 years over the things she saw in December. She killed herself with prescription pills. And finally, how's the service impacted your life? I'm 23 years old and my mom still refuses to open up about her experiences in Desert Storm. And again, James, those are essentially the ones that are that's our generation of, of people. It closed her off to emotion and affected our relationship more than you know. So we'll include the link to the original army tweet, which they have not they've not deleted. How has serving impacted you? And that makes us think, of course, of some of the other kind of spectacular public relations fails from awful companies and organizations that you would think by this day and age would maybe kind of know better. JP Morgan's hashtag ask JPM shows exa- exactly how to not use Twitter. The banksters got fantastic questions like this one. Has the raw cunning of the electricity big bid rigging scheme been unfairly overshadowed by the scale of the mortgage settlement? Hashtag SJPM. And actually, two that we covered right here, James, in 2014. Original Cheerios go GMO free after PR fail. And hashtag my NYPD, much like the U.S. Army style, attracts photos of police violence and abuse. James, I know there's probably many, many others that we could think of, and maybe even I think there's like very recent ones. Maybe. I I have a feeling that there was a related story to this that I saw recently, but unfortunately I didn't note it down at the time, so I don't remember. But if anyone else out there knows what I might be thinking about, please (laughs) leave it in the comments. But I will add one more to the list. Uh, I did uh, an article a a couple of years ago for the forecaster. Janet Yellen's Twitter Q&A was a glorious dumpster fire where Janet Yellen had a Twitter Q&A, and there was some... Uh, a humorous question. So there is always a bit of schadenfreude from these types of uh, Twitter own goals where you can't even imagine what they were thinking. What were you expecting to receive from this? But unfortunately, there really is no joy to be taken from the truly horrific stories that are being shared uh, in this latest U.S. Army uh, tweet. It is uh, it is another sobering reminder of who are the real victims of war, which is essentially everyone, including the people fighting them. The only winners are the ones that are 
paying for and and uh, being paid uh, from the, the the blood that is being shed. And everyone is a victim in this, including the the troops that are just thrown in the meat grinder and then left to rot after the uh, the conflict is over. So it's uh, it's another bracing reminder of exactly what the U.S. Army is and what it's about. I'm glad that they allowed the public to do this. They gave the opportunity for the public to, to do this and for people to see. And, and it is important, I would say, at least on this level, because, again, like so much else, corporate uh, media and Madison Avenue, they always try to pretend that everything is hunky-dory and everyone loves everything that's going on and everything is peaches and rainbows. And if you have a a tragic story, if you have a problem, if there is something dark in your life, you're the weirdo and you shouldn't talk about it and you should just, you know, try to go along to get along. No, you, you, you ask the question and suddenly there's a million people with these horrible tales, heartbreaking tales. Um, it just goes to show you are not alone. And, uh, that is an important message. Just that in and of itself, you are not alone and you are not crazy for, for having uh, experienced this or for going through something dark like this. So I, I, I at least enjoy the fact that this has opened the window to that, con- uh, that, that, that segment of society that is often swept under the rug um, at every opportunity. In other smaller ways, you'll see this on just the sponsored tweets and the the ads. Again, I've I've said it was like, yeah, Twitter's the one mainstream social media that I've kind of stuck with, and it's the only one that I really use. I essentially report or flag nearly every advertisement or promoted tweet that shows up. But also, when you look at them, if they are any kind of contentious product, you know, gross food, chemical, you know, products – you look at the replies and you learn a little more. It's like, oh man, people are people are getting hip to this and at least taking eight seconds to go, your company's garbage, you're full of chemicals, and you sold out to Clorox. You know, this those sorts of things. <laughs> uh, the only other sort of recent PR failing, I was asking my own media monarchy chat, Lockheed Martin recently had a hashtag world photo day fail. That was I, I it was last summer. And they were reminded, of course, about all their bombs that are helping fuel war crimes going on in Yemen. And I did a propaganda watch on that. Yikes. James, as our third and final story this week, how about a little not unmitigated good news? Tenants win as settlement orders landlords give physical keys over smart locks. In a settlement released back on May 7th, a judge ordered landlords of an apartment building in New York to provide physical keys to any tenants who don't want to use the latch, that's the company name, latch, smart locks installed on the building last September. The settlement is a first, as there's no legal precedent or legislation deciding how landlords can use smart technology. Since the technology is relatively new, lawmakers haven't had a time to catch up with smart home devices, and this case in New York is one of the few legal challenges to appear in court. It won't set a legal precedent, as CNET claims, but I would note it sets kind of a a psychological precedent, again, because these are all about – these are information wars. Memes are mind viruses, and we can kind of plant those seeds. It won't set a legal precedent because it's a settlement, but it represents a win for tenants who had issues with smart locks and landlords installing them against their will. Latches smart locks are installed in more than 1,000 buildings in New York In this case, a settlement could mean future challenges from tenants who also have privacy and security concerns. They'll include the link to the previous and actually much more lengthy, much more informative story from CNET. Tenants worry smart home tech could be abused by landlords. James? It is positive that people noted this problem and did something about it and solved it. Good. Excellent. Now, I hope that these same people will continue applying this principle, and everyone who's watching this will step back and say, oh, there may be something going on here. And I'll direct people, I can't remember exactly when it was, it was a couple years ago, we did here on New World Next Week, we covered the hotel ransoms that were going on, where uh, people would hack into the hotel systems and lock all the doors and give us Bitcoin and we'll, we'll open the doors again. These are the types of security concerns that pop up in this smart tech uh, nightmare that is coming into view, this prison, the technological prison that's being constructed around us, and that most people are blithely walking into. So I hope people will continue extending this principle. Yeah, maybe we don't want smart locks. Maybe we want an actual physical key we can use to open and close our door. And, oh, hey, maybe we don't need Alexa sitting in the corner of our room listening to everything we do. Maybe we don't need these smart baby monitors and smart microwaves and smart toothbrushes and whatever else they're coming out with. Maybe 
we should st- put the brakes on this before we connect everything to everything else in the Internet of Things. I am, in fact, busily working behind the scenes on a report about 5G and the Internet of Things and the surveillance aspects of that, so I hope people will stay tuned for that in the future. But uh, in the meantime, all I can say is at least this, again, at least it opens the door to, and to the conversation amongst the wider public. Absolutely. And that's, I guess, ultimately all that we're trying to do is get those conversations going, get those seeds planted, get the, the ideas circulating with everyone. James, as I always like to say, I stream news, music, memes, and more Monday through Friday, 9 to 5. I would love folks' support at MediaMonarchy.com slash join, as, as we've been saying many, many times. Yeah, I don't care how you support us, just as long as you support us. I've got all the, all the hated ways, like Patreon and PayPal, and all the super new ways that nobody actually uses yet. It's all at MediaMonarchy.com, James. Excellent. And I'm looking forward to meeting our Morning Monarchy once again next week. Yes. All right. All right, buddy. All right. All right. In the meantime, good talking to you. Talk to you again next week. Thanks, buddy. Take care.